Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're really, really pleased to have Susan Scott Parker with us today. For those of you that don't know Susan, she's the founder and CEO of the Business Disability Forum, uh, of which uh, I'm happy to be a contributing member of their task force. Susan, you've been doing this for a while. I won't say how many years, uh, it's not gentlemanly, but um, can you tell me a bit about yourself and the BDF and, and how you uh, came to be working in this field? I am, that's a, a very long conversation, I suspect. The short story, so I'm Canadian. I did some work with the Canadian government trying to help them to understand why the campaigns they put in the newspapers didn't persuade companies to employ more disabled people. Discovered that actually the campaigns were using language the employers didn't understand about people they hadn't met. Uh, and the ads were in magazines they didn't read. Aside from that, they were, of course, hugely successful. And so somehow that piece of research got into the hands of business and the community here. And there was a conference in 1986 where 100 companies came together and the question was, why do you not recruit 3% of your workforce as disabled under the 1944 quota legislation? And so when you started to listen to what the employers were saying, you realized that we were stuck in a kind of time warp where the companies are saying, we don't get suitable disabled candidates, it's too hard to find them, we don't know how to do this, we're all, we always get the blame even though they don't apply. Disabled people are saying, we can't find the employers that want to hire us. Now my image at the time was like those blue whales, they argue that the blue whale population is at risk because they can't find each other to mate in the big open seas. Is that an appropriate image here? I'm not sure. But the point being that the legislation was wrong, the quota message, we have to hire you because you're damaged, completely counter to the message to say the people wanted and most employers wanted, which of course is I'll hire you because you can do the job. The system was dysfunctional, failing to meet the needs of the employer, making it unnecessarily difficult. So we thought we should try something different, especially since most employers have met so few people with disabilities as far as they knew. And so we we thought, what if we created a business-owned organization that could then work with disabled people directly to get a better understanding of what employers need and what disabled people need, if we're going to get this right, so that we could then together turn to the government and say, you've got to get your act together, because the legal framework, the system in the middle between employers and disabled people just doesn't deliver. So, so effectively matchmaking between the companies and... Well, in a way, but it's at, it's at more of a system level, because don't forget, we kind of invented this business disability networking where we work in the domain where the interests of the enlightened business leader, the interests of a business federation like the Confederation of British Industry or the Chambers of Commerce, and the interests of disabled people overlap. So we're not part of the system that is supposed to help disabled people into jobs. Uh, we're not part of the disability movement per se. It's a business community committed to self-improvement and seeking to work in partnership with disabled people to help create a system that works better for everybody. Because in the long run, of course, more, uh, more people in work contributing to the economy and to the communities in which they, they live uh, delivers benefits for business, individuals, societies, we all know that. Okay, so you've kind of given me already a bit of the rationale behind behind the BDF, um, and, it, and it started as the Employers Forum on Disability, and, and so my understanding is it's originally HR led, um, because you were looking at how you can you can bring this into employment, and we started some other stuff later, uh, which we'll go on to um, later in the interview. Um, so. I understand you, you saw the need. Um, who were the other people that, that you, you worked with during that time to, to, to set it up? And, 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 and why was it that you felt that, that no one else was doing it? Because you obviously saw the need for it. Well, I think we worked with a, a group of individuals that came from a range of companies, including the BBC, Barclays Bank, Midland, then British Telecom, Prudential. 
But these were individuals who had personal contact with people with disabilities working in NGOs or social enterprises. Uh, and so they, they felt that if a group of companies could come together and joint fund a central expert team that would focus on making it easier for the business to learn how to both uh, recruit and employ people with disabilities, uh, that we could, we could generate a kind of sea change in terms of how uh, both the opportunities for disabled people generally and the extent to which companies would come to see this not as a societal or social thingamajig, but actually as something to do with investment in human potential. So I can't pretend that corporations came together. It was individuals working inside these companies who persuaded their colleagues that creating something new in this domain had, had the potential to affect long-term change. We've got three major shifts we're trying to, to work towards. One is to move disability so that it's seen to be about rights and uh, performance, productivity, enhanced business performance, investment in human potential. The second, of course, is moving business from being unwilling and unable to willing, able, and actually delivering the best practice that we call disability competence. And the third one is to shift the employer or the business from being the problem, or worse, to being at least a valued user of the system that is supposed to help disabled people find jobs and at the best of partners. So the, the context for us has always been given we're trying to do those three things, shift how disability is seen, shift the performance of the business, and shift the perception of business. Only a business-owned organization could actually drive that kind of change. Yeah, so um, you're very, although you're a, a charitable organization, you're, you're very different from many of the um, disability-specific charities that, that I'm also aware of and, and touch my day-to-day -day working life. Um, so, and I'm, I'm aware that that you've morphed over time to, to look at um, things like technology. So, because you, as I said, you started as an HR-led organization. What was it that drove the logic to create the technology task force? Well, I think actually, if we come back to the logic of moving from the Employers Forum on Disability to the Business Disability yes. Forum, and then the task force, if you like. Yes. When we were set up, we naively believed that HR could really make a difference. Um, we thought that you would improve the, the employment prospects of disabled people if HR got their act together. But actually, while they play a hugely important role and often get in the way, um, unless your property guys play ball, unless technology actually steps in and makes the adjustments the individual needs, unless procurement doesn't outsource your facilities management to an outfit that is just, just disability dumb. All these parts of the business need to line up. And we also found, of course, that if you're wanting to get senior executives to understand the need to invest in improving their oh. disability performance, they have to see how disability affects the whole business. Oh. And actually, the message is that making it easier for customers to spend money with you just makes business sense. are really quite powerful. So we actually launched our Welcoming Disabled Customer Guide in 1993 at an event, I remember well, Cedric Brown. It was a famous day because his shareholders had taken a huge pig to the AGM on the grounds that the senior executives were paying themselves too much. Before your time, I'm sure. But it was a memorable day. And so we launched the Welcoming Disabled Customers because we were learning that if you remove the barriers for customers, you were removing the barriers for employees. Uh, customers can get in the building, usually means employees can get in. Yeah. Uh, the frontline staff, positive about responding to the needs of disabled customers, probably find it easier to work alongside someone with a disability because they've got over some of the embarrassment or unease they might have experienced uh, in theory. So from there, of course, we discovered that if you want to mobilize the whole business, you have to shift the language away from why don't you recruit more disabled people as the only conversation to saying at senior level, why don't you improve your ability to adapt for human beings, whether they be talented applicants, whether it's an employee who's been with you for 10 years and has just become disabled, or whether it's a disabled or older customer. So the shift to learning to adapt the whole business so that more people can contribute 
meant that we had to move more into the business space. Hence, we're now the Business Disability Forum. And then the Technology Task Force came into being because our approach has always been so practical, Neil. We look at what gets in the way when the applicant is trying to get in and compete, what gets in the way when an individual develops migraines and is trying to get the light changed, what gets in the way when a customer is trying to give you his custom. And we spot the practical obstacles and then try to remove them yes. or whatever. And of course the technology kept coming up. Technology was getting in the way of applicants. That work McKinsey's did for us a few years ago, pro bono, I say quickly, they found 1.3 million people in the UK alone who could not apply to most jobs available online. I mean, that's just that's just people who can't even begin to compete to prove what they can do. And that, that 1.3 million people that are precluded from applying to jobs online is because the systems are inaccessible. Yeah, because the and websites are inaccessible, yeah. because they're using Taleo, everybody's favorite, everybody knows it's inaccessible, people still buy it. Because the famous one at the moment, or the classic one, application forms that won't allow you to use spell check. And then HR have brought in that software that screens out every application with a spelling mistake yeah. as a way of cutting down the numbers so that the recruiters don't have to deal with so many. That's me, that's me not making the SIFs automatically. It's me not making the SIFs because I was determined never to learn how to type in case I ended up as a secretary and I succeeded. I do not know how to type. Um, but I it's learned also, later in life. But it's also people with English as a second language. It's, it's a lot of people. Visual impairment, because often they also time out those application forms yeah. so that you haven't got a chance to work it through. Or they send you to psychometric test sites. They were all inaccessible. And so... Oh, that's a separate bug there. That's a separate one. Well, what I don't understand is why, why it's allowed, if you like. For me, it's the same as putting a sign up on your website that says no black people need to apply. Everybody would have hissy fits and get very upset. Instead, millions of people around the world can't even begin to compete for a job properly on the basis of merit because they just can't get through it. We actually came up with a classic the other day, Niels. There was a company running a system where yes, you could ask the answer the question, do you need an adjustment to the process? But if you ticked yes, it triggered an automatic rejection letter. I mean, can uh, software be prejudiced? I want to throw this at the technology task force. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, anyway, you were asking, though, about the task force. And so when we saw the problems that the technology was causing, often it was unintentional. Um, often it was because the website's controlled out of New York and they, it's not sort of a legal obligation, so we can't do it. Or it was, Talia won't let us. It, you know, there's always been some kind of a if you like an excuse for not dealing with it. So we thought if we brought, not HR, but if we brought the kings of technology together, the, the technology leaders who actually understand how this stuff works, get the message that you have to be as barrier-free as possible for as many as possible, empower productivity, all those headlines, and ask them to solve the problem. And so I think the task force has done remarkably well in terms of getting some very influential uh, technology leaders around the table. I think that the charter gives you a self-improvement framework that any CIO can pick up anywhere in the world. It, the maturity model, you must have been involved, Neil, in helping to craft that. Now no CIO can say, I don't know where my problems are, but they can just go through that and find out. Uh, so that leads into the, uh, the question that I know Antonio was uh, wanting to ask. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I would like to know, how do you monitor the progress uh, and benchmark accessibility? We've got two or three ways of doing that. Um, we monitor uh, corporate performance through our disability standard. And so th this was launched in 05, I think, and we update it every three years. It defines what best practice looks like across the business, whether it's property, communications, I mean, it's astonishing how many brochures are sent out that no one can read because it's in six font on orange on pale green background. Um, so I said property, communications, HR, retention, recruitment, you know, all aspects of customer care, corporate social responsibility. It's a very comprehensive tool. 
it's not used so much to benchmark or as a an exam. We try to use it as a kind of a, a consultancy tool. We sit down and work it through with them in detail and then show them where they've got quick wins, where they've got real problems, and help them to put the two-year plans together that address those, those issues. We're also monitoring in terms of customers, customer feedback, customer satisfaction. Did you see the Walk Away Pound research we launched recently? Where we asked hundreds of customers, how many times have you taken your business away from a bank or a restaurant or a hotel because you didn't like the attitude or you simply couldn't access it? And we're showing millions of pounds floating out there as disabled customers are walking away from that bank and going to that one. But it's the kind of data that the banks have never had before, that the other sectors have never had before. It's capturing huge attention in the trade press, and it turns a kind of question about mythological creatures that I don't know about into, oh, you mean they've got 200 million pounds and it just walked out my door. Yeah, it's a very powerful message. We're also, of course, monitoring in terms of uh, our day-to-day -day work with the members, encouraging them to work with disabled employee networks and their own employees. Now we have more than 325 disabled employee networks in the UK alone connecting through Kate Nash Associates and that magical way she has of building the leadership capability in those networks. Um, they enable our members to take stock, check in with their own people who are also their own customers. How are we doing? What do we need to improve? And in fact, one of the reasons we ended up with the task force, Neil, was John Varley, when he was chief executive of Barclays Bank, had a listening group where twice a year people with an interest in their disability performance, mainly, of course, disabled employees, but not only, had a chance to have the global chief executive for an hour while they, they checked into, uh, you really need to do something. It's taking six months for me to get a new screen reader. And so it was that kind of feedback from his own people monitoring their own performance that caused us to set up the task force. And, and, and since the task force has come into being, you've, you've, helped, you know, you've created the, the accessibility maturity model, which is a, a great way of, of looking at all of the different areas of the technology within the business and, and the processes that go with that. Yeah. I was really pleased to see Shell saying, their uh, technology leader from The Hague, that in three months it saved her a year's work because she could get out there and quickly do the assessment, see where she stands. Because, of course, one of the problems that our IT colleagues have is that it's HR who decide to buy Taleo. Yes. They haven't actually checked in with IT in advance to determine the extent to which it does or does not create accessibility problems. And procurement, in the middle, don't have a clue, if you like. They assume that HR know what they're doing. <laughs> yes, so I, I, I've, I've witnessed this. I've had procurement on site. Um, but then you find that they've bought something because they've already been told to buy it. So it, it's too late. So they can monitor the inaccessibility of systems rather than be uh, a proactive partner in the, the procurement of something that's more accessible. So, and, and the reason I mentioned it, I guess, was because we're talking about the maturity model. Because it's got a governance section in it that's really crucial. Remember the BBC at one point, I don't know if they still do it, you weren't allowed to buy any software unless one of their colleagues, who was herself blind but also very talented and understood all this stuff, had checked it out first. So, so yes, we, we, we still have a, um, a governance process for, for the BBC. As, as a supplier of uh, IT to, to the BBC, we have to go through that um, due diligence process to assess how accessible the software is. Excellent. Uh, now, as you and I both know not everything is accessible out there, and there may not be accessible alternatives. But the the, the governance process is there. So in terms of maturity, actually, the, the, the BBC as an organization is, is highly mature, but they wouldn't rate themselves as a five either. And I think this is a message that, that we need to get across to people, not to be scared of, of taking the plunge with the maturity model, because it's a snapshot, and, and it's a, a way to measure um, both improvement and also because we live in the real world, sometimes we move backwards as well as forwards, and that's important to show as well. Because you may roll out something that's 
um, that the business needs, and you take you take that measured decision that the, bus the business needs actually in this particular instance outweigh the other considerations. Now, I'm not a big fan of that, but it does happen, and well, so you may need to measure it, and you need to capture that. Yeah. So there are two things for me there. One is we've got that point number nine on our charter for the task force that says, you know, we will make accessibility a mandatory consideration when purchasing. And remember the way I interpret that is, and we'll only buy accessible technology unless there's a letter from your mother. Sometimes there is a letter from your mother. You just can't get around it. But then we want the process afterwards to ensure that the supplier agrees to continuously improve that accessibility over the next few years every time they do an upgrade or whatever. We're also looking at members starting to combine their purchasing power. Corporations, public and private sector, typically deal in isolation with these big IT suppliers. So now that the companies are coming together to have conversations with SAP to say, we actually expect a, a higher level of accessibility related services from you guys. When they do that as a collective with billions of expending, you know, uh, uh, billions of pounds to spend in that collective, suddenly SAP are talking to us and exploring how they can work uh, more effectively in this domain. That's and it's interesting to see about Gartner, don't you think? Oh, oh, absolutely. So the SAP thing is probably the proudest crowning moment of my career, getting them to talk to, to, to our members. Um, I think they're a hard nut to crack. Uh, I think Gartner is, is also really interesting um, be, because the, the people that make the decisions about IT listen to what Gartner are saying. Uh, it's, it's all very well me telling my CIO that... Uh, that this is important, but there's a bit more weight to it when someone from Gartner is saying this is the trend, this is this is important, this this is of strategic import to your organisation and to your customers. So it's great that Gartner is starting to really take accessibility seriously. And I think as we look at the history of how regulation and standards is emerging in this space, it's interesting that in the European Union. When I go to meetings and I'm asked to fill in a form that says, what stakeholder bunch am I in? Am I a disability lobbyist? You know, am I a government? The fact that the task force represents the purchasers of technology, not the industry. When they say industry, they mean the IT sector, the Microsofts of this world. Yes. Um, they, they, it never occurred to them to involve them in this conversation. And when you say, but actually, it's one thing to support the development of a you know, assistive technology, say JAWS, but if the manager in this bank won't let him use it, all the assistive technology in the world is a complete waste of time. Because it's the banks who say yes or no. It's the managers who let you use it or don't. There was a law, a law firm in, in uh, Madrid fired a young blind lawyer. He came number one in law school in Madrid because they didn't like the look of all that weird kit. Wow, okay. so. That brings us neatly on to the next one, the next topic, which is what what is it that gets in the way? What are the barriers when big companies try to do stuff to, to be more inclusive? Because we've got lots of members and lots of goodwill uh, within the BDF and, and especially within the task force. What gets in the way? I think the most fundamental is lack of face-to-face -face contact between business leaders and people with disabilities. I mean, what, when I talk about the more than 300 employee networks, that's been a huge breakthrough in terms of making it easy to have informal conversations on this subject. Around the world, the only conversation that most managers have with the external environment, if you like, is why don't you recruit more disabled people? The conversation over a glass of wine that helps the manager understand the guy's reality is a very different conversation. So. It's, it's stereotypes, it's assumptions, and it's the failure of, of almost every government I can name to fund support services that actually meet the needs of the employer. Somehow, the disability industry worldwide assumes that actually, kindergarten, um, assumes that we can just focus on the person, somehow push them at the world of work in, at random and hope they magically find some 
employer somewhere mm -hmm. to, to do. So one of the uh, the reasons we were set up is to fill the gap that government uh, policies create. Because if if there were services out there that said, what can we do to make it easier for the employer to say yes? What support does his manager need? What information does he need? How can we pre-screen applicants so that only the right candidates come through? How can we help to attract people with autism at the moment? You know, we're looking at what SAP has done and other companies. But when our members say, okay, let's give them a go, they don't apply. The, the labor market is so inefficient, so distorted by deep-rooted negative assumptions about disabled people and by employers. Now, we were set up precisely to address that. So our members joint fund a helpline. Managers can call to say, I don't know what to do. I'm interviewing a blind person tomorrow. I don't know what to do. I've got someone off sick for a year with a mental health condition. Most countries, it's impossible for a manager to get that kind of advice. And of course, we're still only 350 organizations strong. So there are thousands and thousands of companies out there who don't know where to go. Absolutely, but you still represent, what's it, 20% of the UK workforce? Yeah. It's a significant chunk. Um, yes. But one of the topics that comes up regularly in the, in the task force meetings is the, the fact that we work for international companies, that um, whilst there may be willingness within the UK organization to make adjustments, that IT systems in, in large organizations are probably um, the remit of someone outside of this country. And that as a consequence, it's outside of our power to change things. So I know that, um, that you've created Business Disability International. Can you tell us a bit more about about that initiative, because I think that's that's an interesting next and logical next step. Well, it it comes directly out of the experience of multinational companies operating in the UK, who found themselves either unable to remove obstacles in terms of whether it's applicants, their people, or their customers, because it's controlled out of New York or Singapore or whatever, and because of course. Uh, increasingly, these are global marketplaces. So the conversation the task force had with SAP, she's in Germany, we're here, Gartner's just flown in from New York, and so it's all, it's a global marketplace that we're trying to influence. So the, the board at BDF decided what we should do is to set up something as a, as a social enterprise that would be tasked with answering what sounds like a fairly straightforward question. What does global headquarters need to do? What does central head office need to do so that their leaders at national level can lift above what is usually pretty unhelpful, if not stupid law, into best practice, right? Because it's one thing at headquarters to say, we want best practice or we want at least legal compliance around the world, but actually we've no idea if our buildings are accessible so that we could recruit a wheelchair user in New York and he can get into the building in Rio. They just don't know. The contracts with global facilities management providers don't actually require them to actually ensure a high level of accessibility over and above local building codes. So what does global headquarters need to say and do so that they can move into best practice, break out of a compliance mentality, and lift above legislation which typically distorts their understanding of what this is all about? If you look at how many countries now still have quotas, Employment quotas, which require two or four or five, six percent of your workforce to be disabled according to some narrow medical definition. Uh, the, the message is, of course, you have to hire me because I'm damaged, but only if I'm damaged enough. Because if I'm not damaged enough, you don't count. And the fact that this legislation is grounded in something invented in World War One by the Germans to compensate wounded soldiers coming back from World War One when it was probably pretty good practice. It somehow gets lost in this. So our job is to help leaders at global headquarters to communicate a new vision of what disability really is all about. Our aim is to adapt for everyone so they can contribute. We're not going to ask you to prove you have a disability according to some narrow list. Uh, we don't 
only regard disabled people as those who are quota qualified. We're interested in being barrier free for everyone who needs us to adapt if we're going to actually enable their contribution. So it's, it's going to be a challenge because, of course, very few people in global headquarters wake up on a Monday saying, so my job is to improve our global disability performance. All too often it gets put into health and safety, dead end, put into diversity. Well, how do they influence their global property standards, their IT standards? But we've got Barclays, Infosys, and um, GSK now firmly there as founders. Other companies are coming around, and I think we might see a property task force at global level, akin to what we're doing in technology. We're looking at the workplace adjustments challenge. GSK has said it wants every employee in 140 countries to have access to the same efficient, speedy service so that the moment they put up their hand in the UK and say, I've got Parkinson's and I need some stuff done to my kit, if they say the same thing in Hong Kong, they get the same response from the IT people in Hong Kong. And I know from most companies, um, the quality of response differs greatly from country to country. So you lose good people unnecessarily. Uh, you're at legal and reputation risk. You're paying fines you don't need to pay if you were just more expert at this stuff. So the opportunity for, for Business Disability International to actually deliver business improvements which drive a more consistent, harmonized approach to people, including customers worldwide, which lifts you above legal risk, reputation gain, and of course you're better able to adapt to an aging workforce in most parts of the world and an aging customer base, because disability know-how equals removing barriers for the 70-year-old who doesn't think he's disabled but can't hear you on the phone. Yes, absolutely, and, and also when, when we start thinking about who are, who are the people that hold the purse strings in a, in a lot of these societies? It's the old, older, older parts of the population. They're, they're the ones that have the disposable income. So it's a, a great imperative for companies to be addressing that. Uh, I think it's, you know, aside from the, the moral um, obligation, we, we can appeal to the, to the financial one. And I think we have to always appeal to both. Well, I, I don't, business. Yeah, I think the the message that treating people fairly is good for business sometimes works. The moral obligation doesn't build a sustainable investment in improving business performance. But what the companies need to hear, of course, is that you're recruiting people because they can do the job. Yes. Do you remember my story, Neil, about being asked by that hostile politician, so what is the business case for hiring disabled people? And I was genuinely taken aback. I hadn't expected it. And I said, I think it's the same as for hiring Canadians. Some of us can do the job. Well, you don't generalize about 38 million Canadians. Why do you try to generalize about all these disabled guys who come with so many different experiences? And so I think we need to shift um, even the discussion about why companies should be doing this into this more of a learning to adapt for people and this is where actually enlightened business leaders, responsible business, and profit come together. Um, but I'm nervous about that phrase, you know, what is the business case? Because most disabled people hear it as purely commercial. I remember a wheelchair user, a young guy, said to me one day, why do you need a business case for treating me properly? That's true. Yeah. But most business people don't realize that they can recruit him on the basis of capability. They think, particularly in quota countries, they're being asked to recruit him because he's a wheelchair user. Yeah. Uh, quotas I, f I find to be damaging. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that something that was well-intentioned actually has a deleterious effect. Absolutely. And the system, of course, that fails to give you suitable candidates is funded by the fines. So these agencies in countries like Poland and Germany are funded by the failure of the, of the quotas. So. Why would they ever agree to remove the quotas and try something different? It pays their salary. Yes, that's turkeys voting for Christmas. Yeah. Excellent. It's not a new and, uh, metaphor there, but I'm with you all the way. No, no. no. Um, 
So I, I, I'm totally with you with the quotas because, again, the, the whole idea that you're recruiting someone that's damaged enough is, is very sad. Um, I'm passionate about the, the contributions that we're making as an organization to, to the task force because we believe that if we create the right environment, you're enabling people to be productive and, and con fully contribute to the, the life of the, the, the company rather than just being someone that's wheeled into the corner to sit there and rock. You know, it's yeah. really important for people to have a proper career path and to be able to contribute fully. And when you ask about what gets in the way, particularly internationally, it's that disability is still regarded as a medical problem, you know, when you were talking about damage. Yeah. And so, so the more we convey these simple messages, saying to managers, impairment is what happens to you, dyslexia, disability is what we do to you, not let you use spell check. Impairment is what happens to you, your diabetes, disability is what we do to you, refuse to let you take the breaks you need, have a snack. So we need to find much more powerful ways of just shifting this understanding that disability is actually something that can be addressed by the company. Even if they can't fix your impairment, they can put the ramp in so you can get in. Yes. But, but most countries around the world, they, they're actually not very good at conveying that message. We're still stuck in um, the medical model. And it's a dead-end model. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's one that's it's, it's day is long past. Um, we've reached the end of our half an hour. It's flown by. I, I'm really grateful that you were able to share your, your great experience with us today. So um, I'd like to say thank you and look forward to you joining us for the Twitter chat tomorrow. I'm sure it's going to be... Great, thank you. So thank you very much and goodbye for now. Okay. Goodbye for now. Thank you.